thank you everyone for all your patience. Um, th that technical problem seemed almost insurmountable. <laughs> anyway, um, I've been at this stuff for many years, since at least uh, 1998. Um, that's being very active. Um, prior to that, between, uh, say, 19, 1971 and mid-1990s, 1995, I, I would have occasional lucid dreams that would um, suggest to me that I was uh, going out of body and learning various things on various places. This started uh, shortly after my father died, and I had an interesting dream where he said to me, this would be about 1969, uh, try to imagine I've gone on a long holiday. That didn't make a lot of sense, but then I didn't, I was only 16. It didn't, you know, you know, I, I just had to accept it. But then um, about two years later, I came into that now pretty famous book, Life in the World Unseen by Anthony Borgia, read it. And then his message to me or several messages uh, made a lot more sense. So um, that went on through the 70s and 80s. Uh, occasional lucid dreams where I would realize through my reading of esoteric literature that I was being taught by guides various things about astral travel and how to handle myself there. And um, certain experiments were set up, as they often do with uh, young aspirants. One of them, the, the most famous one, I think you might have heard this from other people, is they'll have you fly in your astral body through a forest fire. And if you panic and think that you're actually going to get burnt and rush back to your sleeping body, they will know that your identification is still with your physical body and not sufficiently with your astral but <laughs> I passed that test. I knew I was uh, in my astral body. But just to give you an, one example, there were, there were many others of uh, teaching and testing nature. And um, I, but I was reading enough theosophy and spiritualism and general esoteric teachings uh, that I understood what was going on, but I didn't really see my, myself as making much progress. But, you know, I knew what was going on. Um, so in the early 90s, I got very fascinated with the crop circle phenomenon in England. And I went over uh, like five times during the 90s. And uh, many interesting things happened, including being amazed at the the beauty and the complexity of the crop formations. But I realized that uh, we, we'd often, as groups of people, get invited into a crop circle to meditate. And uh, I took great advantage of that. And after a few years of that, I felt that uh, meditating in crop circles in increased my vibration quite significantly. And by the end of that decade or toward the end of that decade, I felt like I could do a lot more, including distance healing and more astral travel. And then around 1998, 1999, I started doing a lot, almost every other night. And that my notes from those uh, situations became that first book, Eternal Life and How to Enjoy It. And uh, that book didn't get published for about four years, but when it did, uh, you know, gave me a, a boost and uh, Hampton Roads at the time liked the book and asked me to do another. So I was uh, making uh, notes for the second book, uh, More Adventures in Eternity. And also around that time, I discovered uh, the books of Bruce Moen and the Hemisync tapes from the Monroe Institute. And um, I used those quite extensively and found them extremely useful for um, uh, making uh, conscious daytime projections um, as opposed to remembering lucid dreams at night. And my second book, More Adventures of Eternity, is filled with uh, those type of experiences. 
where I would uh, have on headphones, use the hemisync tapes and project quite often in my lunch hour from work. Uh, and a um, lot of interesting experiences there, a lot of retrieval work, uh, you know, helping earthbound souls that were stuck one way or another. I'm sure you're familiar with that process. And um, as those uh, experiences went on, I started to get more and more interested and attached to what we call the higher self or the monad. And uh, my second book does explore that quite a bit, that, that being that projects its bits of itself into incarnation and becomes a life, like I am a life, and also our past lives. So my, uh, the next book was um, uh, You Are History, which is an exploration of uh, the higher self and, um, you know, the uh, relationship between the incarnating individual and the higher self. And that's it's quite a, a subtle thing to talk about because as you uh, approach and merge with your higher self, it becomes difficult to tell where you end and where higher self begins. You, your consciousness has become merged. And that's an interesting exploration in itself. Um, I also try to uh, write a book for young people because I noticed the New Age movement seemed to be filled up with middle-aged and older people. So I wrote a funny novel called An American in Heaven about a teenage girl that uh, dies in a car accident and her experiences in the afterlife. And um, I wouldn't say it was terribly su successful reaching younger people, although I did my best with, you know, a kind of a trendy looking cover and uh, a certain, you know, uh, portraying this young woman with her attitudes. Um, you might say, how did I know young women and their attitudes? Well, in that time period, for many years, I was a school bus driver. And I was very familiar, or I became very familiar, with how young people uh, relate to each other uh, and how they think about life in general. So um, that went on. Let me see. Uh, I just kind of did more of the same and much more uh, interaction on the Internet, you know, websites and uh, Facebook groups, although they were a little later. And I started to make a lot of videos on YouTube. And if you go to my YouTube channel, you'll see there are, <laughs> oh, a couple of hundred videos right there. And uh, the ones you'd probably be most interested in are called the OBE Journal 2017, OBE Journal 2018, and OBE Journal uh, 2019. And there are many uh, explorations of the various levels of the astral plane, many spirit encounters with um, oh, uh, all sorts of people, uh, uh, deceased celebrities who passed on in many different ways, some through uh, drug addiction, some through, um, uh, how shall I say, just illnesses, and uh, many um, uh, spirit contacts with also politicians. I, I spoke to JFK and RFK um, and others. And just over those three years, I was very confident and was very able to sustain a long, um, you know, exploration and then speak for, you know, 45 minutes to an hour into a YouTube video at, you know, four and five in the morning and have these uh, encounters recorded. And um, you can check that out anytime you want. They're always there. Word of Gord uh, at YouTube. And uh, those uh, encounters have, I took advantage of our uh, cultural shutdown in 2020 to uh, transcribe a lot of those into a memoir. And that will be, it's called uh, Moving Through Many Dimensions. And that should be, yeah, I hope to have that published in January or February. Uh, some of it is appearing on uh, Facebook groups like uh, the various out-of-body travel Facebook groups, uh, the TMI out-of-body travel. If you wish to check out some of those, there's a few of them there in text. Um, 
I've done a few interviews like this, although this is the first, I would say, group interview where, where you know, many people are participating. I've, the others have all been one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. And um, I do a little bit of distance healing and client referral work. Uh, I'll talk to clients on Skype and we will do a past life regression or a spirit contact uh, as they have requested. And um, the internet being the internet, that's a very international sort of situation. I'm regularly talking to people in Australia or California or Germany or Norway. Um, and uh, I find that vastly interesting to talk to people from different cultures and see how they uh, feel about the afterlife and their relationship to it. Um, uh, let me see, is there anything else? Um, I think that's a basic grounding in what I do. Um, I'm very active on the internet. There's always posts on Facebook and I participate in uh, discussion threads. And um, I'm still very interested in all the, the topics that I have just described. I'm more recently trying uh, more carefully and consciously to, to communicate with elemental beings like fairies and elves and devas. Um, I had read about that for many years, but in the last few years, I'm very much trying to communicate them and communicate with them and establish a bonding. And a little bit with the alien entities too, or the, the uh, UFO occupants that we call alien entities. Because I feel like it's um, we're in a brotherhood of sentient beings. We all belong together and we should all try to communicate as much as we can. Um, so I've expanded into that a little bit, although I'm still interested in talking to uh, the deceased human being. And um, you will see any recent things. I talked to the poet Leonard Cohen just a little while ago. Um, and other entities, perhaps you know the, uh, the um, how shall I say, the philosopher of the DMT experience, Terence McKenna. I had an interaction with him about a year ago, um, or <laughs> he as he exists on the astral plane. He's not really a human being anymore, but um, he's a very interesting uh, uh, spirit, shall we say, to interact with. Um, I'm trying to, you know, uh, shorten this because, you know, because of our technical difficulties at the time. And um, but I think that sort of sums it up. And uh, some of the uh, uh, interactions that are in my uh, the newest memoir, which isn't published, but you can see them all on uh, various uh, YouTube videos that I described. Uh, there are very, very straightforward interactions with, you know, the human dead and the people that are astral traveling at night and they're doing it consciously. And those are fairly regular interactions, but I do talk to um, fairly elevated beings that uh, discuss, how shall we say, philosophical complexities and niceties. Um, and um, that's a little more complex. So I, I try to cover the whole range of consciousness. Oh, well, certainly uh, eternal life and how to enjoy it. My first, that's a guided tour of the afterlife uh, done by my then guide, Henry. And uh, he kind of showed me around, but I was, it was also very consciously done in that time period, the late nineties and the millennium to uh, cater to that, cr that new group of readers that had uh, read a lot of the uh, near-death experience books. There was a whole flood of them at the time. So I knew that there were many people that had seen glimpses of the afterlife and needed to know more. So essentially, that's what that, that book caters to. Oh, I'm, I'm, I, I mean, they're ob obviously, they're just little glimpses, but they're very inspiring. And I, I would uh, include the two, two that, that you put up on your uh, most recent afterlife report. The uh, gentleman who uh, uh, 
has recovered from that car crash in which his wife and one of his children died. And uh, his experience there was quite remarkable. And the second video where the, uh, he and his uh, doctor are interviewed. And the doctor also uh, spoke of his uh, vision with a, a nurse of uh, the spirit of the man's wife hovering over his bed. Um, th now, those were short experiences, but I mean, their, uh, their value is unquestioned to me. Um, well, I've certainly uh, read memoirs by people, or essays at least, who feel that they are starseeds, who f feel they're more, um, how shall I say, attached to an another star system than this one. And uh, I know some people personally who feel that. Um, I think it's uh, a a part of our growing uh, consciousness uh, to uh, e experience this information and uh, spread it around. Um, myself, I feel that I came, or my higher self, shall I say, not me, my higher self, my monad that I belong to, came to this planet, as did many others, when it cooled down enough in order to sustain human life. But, and we all, I think we all came from different planetary systems. I suspect I came from Sirius, but, uh, and others feel, you know, Andromeda and Lyra and different things. Um, uh, but I, we've been here a long time incarnating and reincarnating. So uh, while I acknowledge that source, in another planetary system, I feel it is uh, more uh, significant and important for our own evolution to understand our various human incarnations and how they all fit together. Although I have friends that, that are actively exploring their starseed roots rather than their um, human incarnations. My sense and my experience is that however much you explore your relationship as an incarnated individual uh, with your higher self, it's all it always turns out to be more complicated than you think it's than you think it is. Mm -hmm. We are definitely connected to our higher selves in a very deep and eternal way, uh, but the other projections of the higher self. Uh, onto the planet, and it seems to have an inexhaustible supply of energy to do so, uh, includes the, you, the past lives that you would think of as your past lives, but also the lives and past lives of other, shall we say, souls. And um, like I say, it always turns out to be more complex than you think it is when you first investigate it. But I would uh, say that it's always worth exploring, even if you reach a level of complexity that you find is almost too dazzling to, to, uh, to uh, you know, swallow. Um, but, uh, for example, I found out through uh, clients and people emailing me, saying, uh, Gord, I saw you on the astral plane, but it didn't look like you, and you helped me with this, and you helped me with that. And this is like, oh, 10 years ago at least, if not longer. And uh, so I had to accept there was parts of me, Gordon, that were on the astral plane that were independent entities that were not me traveling at night under my own steam. So I, di I did, did some investigation, and I found out through channeling, that's a bit of a long story, that um, my higher self, at the time I was born in 1952, four other, shall we say, spiritual entities were projected from higher self, but not to the physical plane, onto the astral plane. And they have uh, a connection to me, but they are also quite independent entities on their own. 
They don't seem to come to the physical plane. They're on the astral plane. And, but they're aware of what I do. And they sometimes, shall we say, answer a call that is put out for me by somebody who knows me. Uh, so there you go. There's a level of complexity that I personally had a lot of a lot of difficulty handling years ago, but I'm used to it now. Well, some one was uh, perhaps you know the uh, Theosophical uh, teacher of the early part of the, well, he's, he's not that uh, Judah Krishnamurti. I Krishnamurti, yes. Krishnamurti. Um, it's in my new book, although, again, it's, it, you could, can see all this stuff on YouTube. Um, I've spoken to uh, Maitreya, who the theosophists feel is a sort of a reincarnation of Christ, although, and, you know, the Christians feel he's the Antichrist. Um, I, I did a lot of interaction with Maitreya, all of which you can see on uh, YouTube. Um, I did a... A small book uh, in about 2007 called Jesus and the Christ, which are uh, channeling, channeled conversations with Maitreya and Christ. And I find that very uh, fascinating because they see the big picture, whereas your quote unquote average dead person tends to see uh, the, the smaller picture of of their transition to the astral plane and their relationship to their family members and friends and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So there's that. There's also um, a Davis. I'm quite like chatting with Davis if I can you know, get, the, get, get them to pay attention to me. Um, I'm just looking at my uh, list here from the contents page of the uh, new book. Um, Guides. I, I talked to a being from 3000 AD. I talked to an inter interdimensional being from Focus 35. I talked to a, a number of Davis. And um, I'm trying to, is there anyone else that would be considered uh, an elevated being? I'm just looking here. Um, a fair number of artists, uh, writers and artists, W.B. Yeats, James Joyce, Arthur Conan Doyle, of course, he's big in, in spiritualism, uh, the artist Salvador Dali and Warren Harris. Um, but, yeah, I guess I've gone through the elevated beings and what I just said. I see, well, for me, it's just a, a practice, long-term long practice. Um, I, I can re recognize my soul energy when it makes uh, a statement or expresses a point of view. Um, you're hinting at doubts about who you're speaking to or what you're speaking to. And I would suggest it's, a, it's just practice. And we all travel through not the valley of the shadow of death, but the valley of the shadows of doubt. And doubt is a journey that you have to go through in order to get to the other side. And everyone's journey through doubt is personal, it's different. But you'll know when you get through to the other side. Um, there's this thing about, uh, for me, doubt doesn't lead to faith. Doubt, uh, doubt passing through doubt, uh, and relinquishing your attachment to it leads to knowledge. Um, in the last few years, it seems uh, that truth uh, it comes out over and over again, either through channeling or people's uh, near-death experience, like the gentleman that's on the... Uh, the current afterlife uh, newsletter just from two days ago. He spoke about uh, that car accident being set up ahead of time. Um, and also a lot of the, the between life regression work um, there, that seems to uh, point to several, what they call exit portals that being set up before you're born. You, you know, maybe you'll, you'll leave here, maybe you'll leave there. And um, I see no reason to doubt that or question it. Um, 
I, I'm wondering <laughs> myself, I'm wondering why I'm living so long. I'm 70 now and it looks like I'm going to go for another 20 years. Um, but uh, I have done some investigations about how I set up this life. But as I said to an earlier question, no matter how many investigations you do or how many meditations you can, you could always do more. You know, each each answer you get begs another couple of questions. You know what I mean? Yes. So exactly. I would certainly agree with what, what you're hearing on this um, line of thought. But it does seem very much as though we set up things ahead of time. Although, uh, as we look at the world, myself, you know, I live in Canada. I came from Scotland. I've lived a middle class life all my life. I've had my ups and downs. But compared to people in the third world and what they have to go through, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I, I live a cosseted, uh, spoiled life. And uh, so I look at people that are living in very troubled countries, and I think, did they choose that? And uh, I w I'm not saying I've got an answer for you, but I would say it's an interesting thing to, to explore in your own meditations. Well, yeah, no, no, that's a very interesting question. And believe you me, uh, my five trips to Wiltshire and Glastonbury and the Corrupt Circle Conference and talking to all the other people that came from all over the world to experience that magic, I mean, we talked about this stuff all the time, and I've still thought about it for many years afterwards. And as you know, they, 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 they occur every year, and you can go to the Crop Circle Connector website and see the pictures of them every year. And um, my sense was that they're designed by a mixture of alien beings and uh, elemental beings like uh, devas, if you like, and I've, I've also experienced in some of my out-of-body experiences, um, I think it's in the book, some years ago, of being projecting to an alien ship uh, hovering over Wiltshire or somewhere like there and watching as several spirits lent over a table, as it were, uh, and designing a crop circle that they were going to project. You know, you know how some of them are very geometrically complex. And I, I don't, I would not think I was uh, participating in the design, but I w was allowed to watch. And I thought that was it was one of those really complicated ones. And I'm, I'm not math mathematically inclined at all, so I was just amazed to be able to watch this and see these people. I say people, uh, I'm talk, talking humans out of body, I think a couple of nature spirits and a couple of humanoid aliens. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a gathering of various species doing something together. But I think the, the, the deeper purpose is for us to see this manifest um, on, on, the, on the soil uh, to see something that was designed in the spirit world, but is manifesting in the physical world in a sort of miraculous way. I do believe that is the purpose. Oh, sure, absolutely. Um, uh, that, again, this is on my, some of my YouTube videos and also in the book that's coming out in quite, quite a bit of detail, I might add. Um, the uh, the mixed media theatrical and dance performances in the astral plane are amazing. Partly, part well, of course, you get people that were dancing, dance and theater people here on Earth, and then they they just do it when they get there. But because of the lack of um, gravity there. Dancers can do this balletic stuff, just like ballet dancers here. But they, when they leap off the ground, they start to fly. And I'm not saying they fly around forever, but that whole, imagine a ballet where they, they don't actually come back to the, to the floor for three or, you know, 30 or 40 seconds. It's quite remarkable. And uh, they will do things, as I say, multimedia things where, um, uh, this dancing will be going on and they will, there will be um, 
uh, images on the wall around you, sort of like paintings, but they're like 3D paintings. And then they will dance into this 3D painting, which will then deepen and they will the, they will dance down it like a picture that's on the wall that's like 10 feet by 20 feet. And then as they jump into it, it deepens you know, into a 3D thing. It's quite marvelous. And um, light shows and, you know, very multimedia. And I, I want to tell you one of the celebrities that I contacted uh, and there's many of them, is David Bowie. And he is totally into this stuff. He just loves it. And when you ask him what he's doing, as I've asked him a few times, he goes, oh, another multimedia thing. And, you know, he goes on and on about it. Um, just a, a small point. Um, I also go to a lot of concerts. I'm a huge music fan, classical, jazz, rock. Imagine any kind of music that you, you, you like at all. Not, not the music I like, the music you like. It's all there. And it's all played either by people that live permanently there or recently dead musicians from our cultures. So there's that. Um, I'm very much an artsy sort of a person. Um, but there's people follow their interests. People that love sports will, will be involved in sports. Uh, perhaps you, um, the Harry Potter films, you know that game that they played in midair? Did you see that? Quidditch. Yes, that's it. Well, I can tell you right now, there's lots of variations on Quidditch on the astral plane. And you can imagine the fun people have doing that. There's a lot of swimming stuff goes on. People that love to swim, they can, because they can float as well as swim, they'll do this glide across a river or a pond, and they'll, they'll glide so that they're like an inch above the water for ages and do all this acrobatic stuff and then go into the water and then come out. All kinds of really clever stuff. Um, uh, people playing golf, tennis, all, the, all the, the sports that you would think of. And their challenge there is everybody can be the perfect golfer or the perfect tennis player using their minds. You know, you direct the ball with your mind, but if you're competing, then it's a game of mind against mind. Do you understand? Rather than, than physical body against physical body. But it, when you're standing watching it, it kind of looks the same. <laughs> um, as I say, I had one or two experiences of being with them, um, not many. I suspect it's um, a mixture. I, I can't see any reason why it wouldn't be. And um, as you sound like you know a little bit about this, so you'll know that there's quite a lot of alien species visiting the planet. And I'd, I'd, I'd say there's more than I, I can count myself. And um, some of them have a, a purpose. You know, they're looking for minerals. They're looking for this. They, they want this. They want that. They want to create hybrids. But some of them are just here to, to explore in a non-invasive kind of way. And um, so I would say there's probably a mixture of alien species, but I can't, can't I don't have enough experience to, to say that with great confidence. Oh gosh, there's lots, there's lots. And I'll explain how that happens. You might have, have you, in some of the channeling, you, you'll, you'll have noticed this. Um, there's hospitals and there's also like rest homes that are like little, that are like houses in the country where you would go for a retreat. And my own mother was in one. Um, she passed after having, you know, dementia for a couple of years. And when she got to the other, my, and my father, by the way, had been dead 50 years by this point. And was, he was completely um, comfortable in the afterlife and he was waiting for her. But um, she, uh, I found her when I went looking for her in an astral plane nursing home, which is sort of like a large home surrounded by gardens in the country. And um, I, she was sleeping when I first got there. My fa father was sitting uh, beside her in a chair, just like you would here. And um, uh, I had much interaction with him because he's been dead since like 1968. So, you know, I have a lot of interaction with him. But um, and we just sat... And then the next time I went, she was awake a little bit. And a doctor came in and said, how are you today, Nancy? 
And she, she goes, oh, I'm feeling a little better, thank you. So, so what you'll see is the medical personnel cater to the, the, the uh, fantasy of the person that's just died. If they think they're still ill, they'll cater to that. Well, you've got, there's certainly a need for all sorts of uh, talents in the astral plane. And uh, as I say, hospitals with, you know, when people die in wars and stuff, as a, I'm sure you've, you've given thought to this, large numbers of people, um, some of them take their wounds with them and think that they ought to be in hospital. You know, one man gets his leg shot off and then he goes to the astral plane and he finds his astral body is actually perfect and there's nothing wrong. But another man will go and think that his, his, uh, his uh, astral body will replicate his physical body. So he'll be in a hospital with one leg shot off and they will cater to his emotional and psychological need to think that he has to slowly recover and they will graft on a, a leg that's actually a thought form but they will do it in such a way that it's convincing to him. So right. yes, you can do all that kind of caring, um, looking after people, if that's what you would like to do. Um, a bit of both. Um, and at this point, you know, I've, been, I've been at this stuff for, at least consciously at this stuff for at least 20, 25 years. So, um, I don't see my guides as much as I used to because uh, like, like with Henry uh, and the first couple of books, he was very um, active and he would show me a lot of things. And he appeared like a um, sort of a middle-aged accountant, the middle-aged accountant that he was when he died, but he would like to play around. He was very, he was very much the trickster and would change his appearance. And I'd meet him in a public place and he'd be hiding behind something and then jump out and go, boo, <laughs> things like that. So, um, uh, but my guides wanted me, and this is covered a lot in the uh, more adventures in eternity, how my guides sort of uh, got shed of me. They wanted me to be an independent operator. This is after ages of, you, you know, following instructions. They said, no, Gord, you can do this by yourself. You don't need us anymore. And, um, uh, so after about, I don't know, 2007-ish, um, I didn't really see guides anymore. Now, I'm not saying they're not there, but what I'm saying is they're invisible and they'll only come if I'm really in some kind of a jam, you know? Usually what happens now is I'm a guide for other people. Well, there's lots of the, the concert halls are similar to pretty fancy concert halls we have here because uh, as you know it doesn't take money and work to uh, build a building it's a thought form so the, they're similar I mean there's all different styles but they're they're very similar but much more beautiful to how we have them here um, but but I would say immediately now I know from looking at your archives here, you guys have interviewed Jürgen Zhu more than once. So um, you'll know that because he's an artist, his, uh, his books and the, his verbal descriptions are very um, picturesque. And I was, when he put out his first couple of books years ago, I was thrilled with them because my experiences are not very um, 3D artistic experiences whereas his are and I I all oh, I don't say I always I often uh, give him a nod and say to people if you want to see how things really look you have to you know check in with Jurgen's you um, so I'm afraid my descriptions will be a little disappointing to you my um, other than to say that they're they're flat out gorgeous and um, you, you the architecture over there is absolutely incredible because of no gravity, because of no um, uh, cost. You will, uh, skyscrapers will have big bubbles in the middle. You know, they'll go up and there'll be this bubble in the middle that will be circular. And then it will go on and it will have bits uh, leaning out. Things that are architecturally impossible here, but they can pull it off up there. Plus the, um, 
the, the colors are much more beautiful and they change. You can go to a building where it's changing color every couple of minutes <laughs> and all sorts of wild innovations like that. In fact, let me just say, you can go to uh, uh, the astral plane cities when you walk down the streets, um, particularly young people, you'll, you'll see this. They'll have t-shirts on that will change color every 30 seconds. <laughs> they just love that. It, you can just imagine how they would love it. And I mean, older people are slightly more conservative, but those are the sort of crazy innovations that you can have there that are that are taken for granted. Okay, uh, two things occurred to me. Um, forgiveness. You for, uh, as we say in the Christian prayer, forgive those that have trespassed against you. And I mean that quite sincerely. Um, and also forgive yourself. If you've got a past life where you've been a mean-spirited, um, you know, a manipulative person, then forgive yourself because that lightens the load. So anyway, the, the whole deal about forgiveness, I believe, is really important. And, and in fact, forgiveness has been a real theme of my current incarnation. I've had to forgive a lot of people for mistreating me. But anyway, I realized I'd set that up. I, I kept, kept thinking years ago, why are people so mean to me? And I thought, oh, no, I have to learn to forgive. It, earlier in this life, I understood the principle of forgiveness quite well, but I wasn't applying it with my heart. Anyway, I got through that one. Um, uh, the other thing is um, the, I, I'm not disagreeing with the, your source about the 120 lives. Uh, it seems to me that uh, we have a huge number of lives, but it can go anywhere from 20 to 500 or something. You keep seeing different estimates from different sources. So I don't particularly want to disagree with anyone. Um, if you feel that that's, you know, appropriate for you, then fine. Um, the important thing to me is the principle of many lives is understood because the, it's an education. We have to have a, no, a huge number of, a large number of lives in order to complete our education because uh, you just have to be different people in different lives. I think you understand that. And um, uh, in order to to walk in the other guy's shoes to order to understand, under, understand what other people, what makes them tick. Well, it's a, it's a lovely idea, but I'm not a musician. I'm just a, a music lover. And I've seen, as I say, I remember seeing all kinds of uh, uh, performances from orchestras to, uh, you know, small jazz and rock groups. And, um, delightful every experience is just delightful i mean they they love if they died thinking oh am i going to get a chance to play and then they find out that they do well naturally they're thrilled to bits they just love it and as does the audience you know when i was in a small club somewhere looking at uh, well it was jerry garcia and several pe people that he knew from southern california they were having a great time the audience was loving it everyone was in a great mood um, and I was very happy to be there. But uh, no, I'm not a musician. So, But other musicians certainly could. Yeah, the yeah. opportunity is there for everyone. Um, well, I was uh, quite influenced by his first couple of books many years ago. And uh, I th thank him for that. Um, I don't particularly, the whole Tibetan Buddhist thing, uh, I have respect for that religion as all other religions, but, but you have to understand all religions are based on ancient sacred teachings that may not be uh, uh, applicable anymore. Um, and I, I, you know, I've been <laughs> I've been a Buddhist in past lives, um, but um, I personally don't, while there's great value in going to the source, going to the God consciousness, I talk about that in a couple of my books, and it's a, a, an amazing experience, but it's also very value, valuable to hook up with the souls 
that you're close to through uh, karmic relations. You know, you can be sure that your uh, whatever, mother, father, sister, brother, uncle, uh, people that you know at work, people that you played sports with, you can be darn sure you knew them in past lives. Maybe not every last one of them, but most of them. And that's, that's what's important to me. You have to explore the depths of that. And it does go on and on and on. It doesn't just go back to, you know, the 16th century or the 12th century. It goes back to ancient Egypt. It goes back to Atlantis. There's lots to explore. So I would suggest go to the source and have a little taste of that, but don't stay there. Well, yes, um, I, I often deal with that on a, a a client level, you know, people will, will do a Skype session with somebody and we'll talk about these sort of a things. Um, I try to take them, if they're afraid of death, I try to take them. I've done this on videos too. Um, in fact, when the, the whole virus panic thing started, one of the first videos I did was, are you afraid of death? And if you are, why? Try to get people to, to think about that sort of a thing. It, it, Everybody's got an attachment to something. Is it an attachment to a young, beautiful body? Is it an attachment to, to raising a family uh, carefully and w wisely? Is it an attachment to a career? Is it an attachment to wealth? You know, there's all these attachments. And if you're afraid of dying, you have to figure out what your attachment is to and work on it because everyone's got different attachments. We're, we're not all the same. And um, once you figure out what that attachment is, you try to dissolve it in meditation. Now, some people are maybe just attached to their spouse. The spouse dies and they're, they're grieving for years. I, I, I recognize the, uh, the uh, significance of that. And I try to help out when I can. But um, you know, grieving is a process and we all take our journey through it at our own pace. Oh, absolutely. In fact, one of the themes of my uh, novel, An American in Heaven, is the teenage uh, heroine gets, she really likes her, her, her life in paradise. She's ha having a blast. But she, she gets drawn back to the grieving of her mother and father. And um, it really, she's, you know, a selfish teenager. So she doesn't really want to deal with that, but somehow she has to deal with it. Now, um, uh, um, on other books, you, you'll see portrayal in channeling. My book was a novel. Uh, the dead uh, young person is, uh, has great difficulty dealing with the grieving of the parents and family members. And if there's a channeled communication, they will say, oh, please stop grieving for me. I'm just fine. Um, so uh, when I'm talking to people that have been through that, I try to remind them if, if they're part of the new age community, as most of them are, um, I try to remind them that a five-year-old child that has just died is actually just as immortal and eternal as they are themselves. And I've had probably 20, 30, 40 past lives. And that this one is just one of many. And obviously it's a huge uh, deal to, to uh, cope with the death of a child. There's nothing sadder, I would think, in life than the death of a child. But you have to face it as a challenge. And that's what I try to get people to do. But you know, it's it's a very tender, difficult situation, and one has to uh, be very careful about how one handles it. <laughs> I'll tell you what happened. You pro from other people that you've spoken to, other psychics and stuff. You'll know about the lower astral plane, where um, how shall I put it? Angry, resentful, jealous, selfish, narrow-minded souls end up and where they end up is not pretty it's not nice and uh, they're often bored because the, they have limited choice but they and, and if you go along as I do and, and others lots of people do this as like an astral plane social worker and try to get them to move on up a couple of levels 
the, they've got all these defense mechanisms. The first is they won't believe you. They think you're lying. Uh, and they think this dumpy place in the lower astral that they're in is, is, is the afterlife. And you'll say, oh, no, it's just a little bit. Come on with me to a better place. And they'll, they'll bitch and complain about being bored because there's not much to do down there. But the fact is that there's not much to do because they're narrow-minded and lack imagination and lack love and lack compassion. The, as as you probably know, they create their own reality, but they don't realize that they're doing it. So they create their own boredom and then blame it on outside circumstances. Yes, I would say, um, although Jürgen and I have disagreed on a few things over the years, um, I, I tend to uh, agree with his vision. I think his Afterlife Answer series is very good. And of course, I love his his visual visuals that he makes up it's quite marvelous how he how he can do that um but um i don't remember all the details of what he says about the lower astral but i'm pretty sure i agree with it all because it, it, you can see this in many books by many travelers and psychics about the lower astral including all the the the, the older books from a uh, hundred years ago the, the portrayal is very similar <laughs> 